Welcome everyone. Thank you for attending today's session on uh, the topic of discussing how Indonesia or can Indonesia achieve deforestation free palm oil. Selamat datang Bapak dan Ibu. Welcome ladies and gentlemen to um, today's session. Um, there's also an interpretation available for you. Uh, we will wait for, uh, for a sec. Audience are still trickling down. We're up to the high 70s now. So thank you so much. Everybody's excited about today's session. I'm sure the panelists would also be, if not more excited than you guys. Um, so thank you for being here today. Um, we have Helen uh, representing Global Canopy Trace, um, Jason Benedict from UC, UCSB uh, also representing um, Trace, and uh, then we have Timer Manorong from Auriga also partnering with Trace uh, is going to be sharing today. Right, we'll give it another 30 seconds. I can already see um, people are very excited. Um, still, the number is still going up. We're up to 80 and more now. 90, going on 90. Um, let's let's wait a sec until um, 100 and plus. Um, if it's possible, so that we can uh, get to know um, each other better, if it's uh, helpful for everyone to put your name and your institution. Um, in the Zoom ID, so we can also better understand um, who is in the room, and we can also involve you better during the discussion session. My name is Gita Shahrani. Um, I'm representing the Sustainable Districts Association, or Lingkar Temu Kabupaten Lestari, um, the head of the Secretariat. And um, the reason why I am very excited to have the opportunity to moderate this session is because for our districts within our membership, it's very important to better understand the type of information that is needed um, to move policy levers and planning levers as well and help this clean up the supply chain and at the end of the day achieve a deforestation free indonesia we have our 2030 target um, that we want to at least protect uh, more than 50 percent of our important ecosystem including forest and peat um, through innovative ways that are putting uh, welfare and uh, local wisdom in the uh, forefront of the battle. And this wouldn't happen without clear and credible and accessible data point information and analytics that we're going to be discussing today, especially in strategic supply chains such as palm oil. So very excited to be here. Um, if you would like to uh, ask a question later during the discussion, um, then please do use the Q&A box. Again, the webinar um, have simultaneous interpretation. Uh, we can switch from English to Indonesian in your Zoom um, function. Please select the globe icon. Um, it's located at the bottom of the screen uh, that says interpretation. And you can select the language that you would like to listen to the webinar in. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Again, uh, the Q&A will be conducted through the Q&A box, uh, not the chat box. So you can use the chat box to interact among ourselves. Uh, but if you do have questions to the panelists, please use the Q&A uh, function. And we will actually be discussing all of the questions at the end of the webinar. A recording of the session will also be shared afterwards, both in English and in Bahasa Indonesia. So you can uh, focus and um, make your own notes because uh, a recording will actually be shared afterwards. For any media present, um, Trace will be happy to work uh, more in depth with you um, after the session even. Uh, so please do contact media at trace.earth with any queries. The contact for the media will be put in the chat box as well. Um, I understand some of the committee is also doing that. So any queries from the media, feel free to reach out afterwards um, to the Trace uh, media uh, committee as well. Um, we will have a one hour webinar. 
today and we will we have four distinguished speakers that um, I'm very excited to uh, help moderate. Uh, we have Helen Beltfield already present in uh, the virtual room. Um, Helen um, represents the Global Canopy and Trace um, and will speak about the research that they've conducted. Um, and also uh, we have Dr. Robert Hels Hellmeyer um, from University of California, uh, Santa Barbara, um, that is also partnering up with Trace in this context. Hi, uh, Helen and um, Robert. Can you hear my voice okay? Yeah, great to be here. Absolutely. Hi. <laughs> Great. Wonderful to have you. Um, then we have Jason Benedict uh, from University of California, Santa Barbara, um, also partnering with Trace in this occasion. Um, and last but not least, one of my idol, gee, my personal idol, <laughs> Bang Timer Manurung from Auriga, also partnering with Trace. So Bang Timer and Jason, can you hear me okay as well? Yes, I can. Thank you. Yeah. Kedengaran. Okay, perfect. Kedengaran, yeah? <laughs> so all the speakers are part of Trace Partnership. And we will now give the first um, honor to open up the contacts and uh, give us a brief highlight about the key findings of Trace New Indonesian Palm Oil Data. So Robert um, from UCSB. The time and floor is yours. You have 15 minutes, and I will remind you when there's one minute left. So go ahead, Robert. Take us away. It's wonderful to be here. Very excited to see all the participants, or I see many kind of names that I recognize in the list of people here. So thank you so much for joining. Um, so I'll give a quick overview of kind of the approach we've taken to mapping supply chains of Indonesian oil palm, and then highlight a couple of the kind of interesting key results that we found in kind of our initial analysis of the data. Um, first, I'll just kind of mention Trace. What we do, Trace maps supply chains by bringing together disparate publicly available data to connect consumer markets to deforestation and other impacts in producer countries. Today's webinar, we're going to focus specifically on our work to map Indonesian palm oil supply chains, but the broader website has a wealth of data on other sectors, other countries. I encourage everyone to take a look and see what's available. Trace is really made possible through contributions from a huge array of institutions with a deep understanding of each of the commodity contexts where we work. For our work in Indonesian Palm, I'll just highlight the critical contributions made by SEI and Global Canopy, the leads on Trace, but also some of the kind of local context partners, Ariga, TreeMap, were both kind of fundamental in creating the, the data that we'll be presenting today. All right, so what did we actually do? To begin our analysis, we combined, compiled what I think is the most complete and accurate database yet, detailing all of the mills, refineries, and ports involved in the production and trade of Indonesian palm oil. This data allows us to better understand the geography of palm oil production in Indonesia. For example, based on the data we've compiled of licensed mill capacities, we're able to estimate the volume of CPO production coming from each of the 1,218 mills that were operating in the year 2020. So in this map, you can see all of those mills kind of highlighted in gray, the refineries in, in red, the ports in yellow. This data is now available on the Trace platform. The next step of our analysis is to try to link those mill level production numbers to the refineries that process the crude palm oil and the exporters that are involved in the trade of that palm oil. So to do that, we're taking advantage of the fantastic levels of transparency that palm oil refiners and traders have adopted in recent years. Specifically, we compile all of the supplier lists that detail the sets of mills from which each refinery sources its crude palm oil. These lists now cover 43 of the 96 refineries in Indonesia and cover about 87% of Indonesian refined palm oil exports. For example, here, you know, we've highlighted the Wilmar Nabati um, refinery in Gresik, um, and you can see the 97 mills that that refinery was sourcing from in 2020. We have that data compiled for all years 2018, 2019, 2020 for all of the refineries and groups that were reporting on their kind of supply chain. So that hopefully is useful data for others, but for us, it's been critical in understanding 
what that supply chain actually looks like. The third kind of critical piece of data are trade data, documenting all of the exports of crude palm oil and refined palm oil leaving Indonesia. This data provides information about the volume exported, the port of export, the names of exporting and importing companies, and where in the world each shipment is headed. For example, the 2020 export records include information about the about 125,000 tons of CPO equivalent exports leaving this Wilmar Nabati refinery. By linking these shipments back to the refineries known suppliers, we can get a good sense of the supply chains that are contributing to each shipment leaving Indonesia. Finally, we use the fantastic remotely sensed data products created by our partners at Ariga and the Tree Map to assess the environmental impact of each of these supply chains, quantifying the amount of forests cleared for oil palm expansion and assigning that clearing to specific exports through this model of the supply chain. This gives us a sense of how much deforestation is embedded within each ton of crude palm oil or refined palm oil working its way through mills, refineries, out of the port and on to exports throughout the world. So just as kind of a quick alternative view of how kind of this model works, here's a quick illustration of how we link these data sets to provide a description of the full supply chain. And what we're trying to describe is how, you know, palm oil that's leaving as exports or being domestically processed and consumed flow back to specific landscapes within Indonesia. Where is that kind of palm oil being grown as fresh root bunches? Where is it being processed into crude palm oil? Where is it being processed into refined palm oil? And then which shipments are kind of taking that on? And so initially we take the trade data and we can segment the entirety of Indonesia's palm oil production into the volumes that are going to domestic processing and consumption and those shipments that are leaving the country um, according to those export records. We can then break those exports into flows that are either going through refineries to the exporter or through known mills. So oftentimes those bill of lading records have the name of a specific mill or a refinery in them. We can link those back to these logistics hubs. About 3% are unknown exporters, but that's a relatively small portion of the overarching production of Indonesian palm oil. We further kind of break this apart into flows going through refineries that have traceability reporting. That's about 47% of all Indonesian um, production and flows flowing through refineries without traceability report, which is about 5% of total production. And then that last step in kind of tracing back that full supply chain is trying to understand where mills are sourcing their fresh root bunches. And obviously I think a lot of the people on the call today understand how challenging that traceability to plantations is, you know, for quite a few of the mills, so about 32% of total production, we're able to make some links based on kind of the names and location of those mills relative to known concessions. But for a large portion of production, we're using kind of just um, a model of transport distances to try and estimate where in the surrounding landscape a mill is purchasing um, fresh root bunches from which suppliers in that landscape. But so that gives you kind of a sense of how we're approaching the supply chain mapping. And then we overlay a lot of different kind of indicators such as our deforestation metric on this supply chain. So what are the key findings that we're getting? You know, we've put in all this effort, we've tried to map out supply chains. What does it tell us about Indonesian palm oil production, about deforestation in Indonesia and the future? Um, of deforestation in the country. So thanks to these fantastic maps created by our partners, we're able to track the location of deforestation for palm oil. Here you can see the total deforestation for palm oil. Kind of the big block is all deforestation occurring between 2018 and 2020, divided into little blocks by province. And what we find is that total deforestation for palm oil between 2018 to 2020 was about 45,000 hectares per year. 66% of that deforestation is occurring inside Kalimantan. Um, and then Papua is actually growing quite rapidly uh, as a growing contributor to deforestation. However, when thinking about this recent clearing for oil palm, it's important to keep in mind the dramatic decline in deforestation that has occurred over the past decade. 
Between 2008 and 2020, annual rates of deforestation for palm oil declined by about 82%. This is an incredible accomplishment and attests to the important progress that the Indonesian government and the palm oil industry have made in slowing palm-driven deforestation. As a researcher in this field, one thing I've sought to understand is what has driven this decline in deforestation, and in particular, the role that no deforestation peat or exploitation commitments have had in this success. So in Trace's last release back in 2018, we didn't see much evidence that exporters with zero deforestation commitments were sourcing palm oil with dramatically lower deforestation footprints. However, one of the things that I've been most impressed by in this new data we've created in this release is the growing evidence that supply chains governed by zero deforestation commitments do have less embedded deforestation. Here I'm showing a graphic that illustrates for each exporter group, that's one of these little bubbles, um, the amount of 2018 to 2020 deforestation associated with each thousand tons of exports. This figure highlights that the supply chains governed by zero deforestation commitments on the right experienced on average about 64% less deforestation than other exporters in 2018 to 2020. I think this is really important result since it represents some of the first clear evidence of a link between zero deforestation commitments and lower rates of deforestation on the ground. This becomes even more interesting when we further break down exporter groups into those groups that are publicly reporting on their supply chains to the right from those that aren't. One way that ZDCs may be driving improvements in the sector is by encouraging companies to trace back their full supply chains and expose those supply chains to public scrutiny. Fortunately, we find that more than three quarters of all exports are traded by exporters with ZDCs and public traceability reporting. So this is one of the things that I think Indonesia has really taken a leadership role in, in adopting these private standards, in implementing them through clear transparency in a level that really doesn't exist in many other globally traded deforestation intensive commodities. Nevertheless, there's still a lot of room for progress. While some of the biggest exporters, so maybe you think of Wilmar, Royal Golden Eagle, Musimas, Sinarmas, have been seen relatively lower and declining rates of embedded deforestation, which is kind of illustrated on the x-axis, especially given the scale of their exports, which are these bubble sizes, right, their market share has actually been declining as kind of a collective over the last few years. So, one thing that kind of jumped out to me is that several of the historically smaller Indonesian-based companies, such as KPN Corp, Astra Agro Lestari, Citra Borneo Inda, they're among the fastest growing palm oil exporters, moving from about 5% of exports in 2018 to more than 10% in 2020. And all three of those groups have both some of the highest kind of relative rates of deforestation per ton of exports, but they also have not fully implemented their kind of zero deforestation commitments by matching them with traceability reporting. So that lack of traceability reporting could be one reason why these groups are re seeing relatively high rates of deforestation. One thing we note is that kind of the average ton of palm oil exported by these groups has a deforestation risk that's about 1.7 times higher than the average of all other exports. Finally, it's important to note that the underlying shifts that have been occurring in the buyers of Indonesian palm oil. Since 2013, India, China, the European Union have been Indonesia's largest palm oil exports markets, together purchasing about 50% of 2013 to 2020 exports. However, the relative importance of each of these markets has changed. In 2013, India and the EU were the biggest importers of Indonesian palm oil. By 2020, exports to India and the EU had declined, and China had become the largest importer of palm oil, increasing its market share from 11% of exports in 2013 to 16% in 2020. Importantly, Indonesian palm oil is increasingly used within Indonesia, which you can see kind of by this big bubble here for the domestic market. Domestic use of palm oil for either local consumption or downstream manufacturing, including production of biofuels, increased from 32% of production in 2018 to 40% in 2020. These shifting patterns of consumption are important in the context of differences in the stringency of environmental commitments. 
So here, now the colors that we've layered on top of these bubbles, which represent the total amount of imports by each country, the colors now tell us what share of those imports are going through exporter groups that have both committed to zero deforestation through an NDPE commitment and have traceability reporting. And it's somewhat striking that you see that, for example, 97% of palm oil flowing to the US, EU, and UK is exported by groups with zero deforestation commitments. These markets bought only 9% of Indonesian palm oil in 2020. In contrast, suppliers for the largest markets in Indonesia, China, and India tend to have less kind of penetration of these stronger environmental standards. So possibly as a result of these preferences, we find that Indonesia, China, and India depend on supply chains with about 2.4 times the per ton deforestation risk of exports destined for export to the EU. Altogether, kind of due to their large purchases, as well as the higher deforestation intensity, we're estimating that about 61% of all of Indonesia's deforestation risk is going to just those three markets, Indonesia, India, China. So, Finally, I'll just kind of really quickly highlight three data limitations. Um, I think, you know, one challenge that we've run into is that we rely a lot on the bill of lading trade data to link back to specific refineries and mills that isn't available for the domestic market. So we have relatively little insight to provide on exactly where the domestic market is sourcing its palm oil from. We're also missing traceability reports for some companies, right? Not everyone is reporting, as I mentioned. And then volumes are almost never included in those traceability reports. I think if Indonesia and the palm oil sector want to take global leadership in um, these kind of developments in, in supply chain transparency, really kind of committing to, to providing volumetric data about those flows would be the next step to take. So the reflection on can Indonesia achieve zero deforestation palm oil? I mean, I think we've highlighted really important progress in this analysis. Deforestation has declined quite dramatically. Exporters with ZDCs and transparency have lower deforestation, but deforestation is clearly still happening. There's a lot of forest remaining inside Indonesian palm oil concessions. Um, Pak Timur estimates you know, it's 2.4 million hectares of forest remaining in those concessions. And the fastest growing markets tend to have weaker standards, less reporting, and higher rates of deforestation. So all of that together makes me slightly nervous that progress can be tenuous. If we look to the example of Brazil, they saw a similar 80 some percent decline in deforestation in the Amazon, and in recent years have seen that begin to reverse. I think doubling down on the successes that Indonesia has had in driving down deforestation and ensuring that continues into the future is a lot of what we're hoping that this data helps um, allow into the future. So I'll provide the link where you can get dive into that data, download all the data that we've created. We've made that all publicly available. And thank you all and look forward to the conversation. Thank you so much, Robert. Um, and thank you also for people that have been providing super live reporting in the chat box. So everybody's paying attention. There's a uh, more than seven, uh, 170 now that's uh, right now are listening to what uh, the reflection that Robert just said. Um, we are going to be launching a poll soon. You can access Trace's explainer about this work at insight.com trace.earth the committee is going to be putting it in the chat box later on so that you can just click um, and it's very um, surprising for some actually that uh, domestic market Indonesia is actually represent a lot of prioritized market engagement supposedly um, if we want to really achieve the deforestation free supply chain for palm oil in Indonesia um, now we're going to be launching um, the poll um, Yep. Oops, sorry. There you go. Um, you can see the poll. Um, oh, it's ended. Relaunch. Okay, wait. Relaunch. All right. Can everybody see the poll? 
if yes, then um, the question is, uh, which measure will be most important to keep up the momentum towards zero deforestation in your opinion? Is it greater demand for zero deforestation supply from China, India, and Indonesia, um, and especially the buyers? Is it strengthening ISPO as a certification uh, platform on traceability, smallholders, and monitoring in particular? Is it incentives from Indonesian government to provinces um, and companies to protect remaining forests? Or is it demand side legislation such as the EU anti-deforestation law? Um, I would have changed a little bit the language, so not only to province, but also to districts, <laughs> so some national government, hopefully. But yeah, we'll keep it running for, the, for uh, another maybe 15 to 20 seconds. Um, it's almost half of you that have voted, so I'll be waiting for us to reach 150. Yes, we can do it. Another 10 seconds, probably. Right now, the poll is showing that majority of you want greater demand for zero deforestation from the buyer side, uh, from China, India, and also the domestic market. Now, up to 40% of the votes. Um, we're, we're up to 131, um, probably the last five seconds. Um, there's 40% still that votes um, demand is actually something that is very key to realize this dream of deforestation free supply chain for palm oil, uh, followed by certification and especially strengthening ISPO on the point of traceability, smallholders and monitoring. Um, it's the third actually most voted. The second most voted is actually incentives. Uh, for, um, from Indonesian government to both local uh, government and companies to protect the remaining forests. And lastly, we have demand side like uh, legislation. Thank you so much. Um, and we are sharing the result right now. Everybody can see the result. So yes, again, um, as predicted, the result is showing that 42% of you have answered that greater demand from the buyer side is depend we are very dependent on that as an element to realize all of our vision for deforestation free supply chain i'm going to read out some of the comments i know uh, some of you is already um, also very very excited <laughs> to uh, ask some questions so just a reminder you can use the Q&A box uh, to ask your question we're going to be selecting the uh, question and answer from there not uh, from the chat box but um, Agusari for example uh, is saying that it's interesting to look at uh, discerning market like EU is not even the largest export market compared to China and India and domestic buyers need to be more discerning. Um, we also have a comment from Joko Arif about forest inside palm oil concessions. Um, it would be useful to check how much of them are categorized as protected areas. Um, and this analysis will actually, will actually help further analysis on categorizing risk on uh, this type of forest as well. And lastly, David Cleary, hi David, is also saying that it's very encouraging to see deforestation decline, but it might be a phase uh, as it was in Brazil. So there needs to be a priority, priority in decoupling risk from uh, riskier deforestation area like Papua, for example, from market where demand for this zero deforestation supply is high. Thank you so much, everyone, for participating very excitedly. Um, now we're going to move on to Timer, and Timer is going to share his perspective on both data as well as policy priorities around Indonesian palm oil. Timer will share for the next 15 minutes as well, and then we'll go to Q&A. So any question that you have for Robert or Timer, you can put in the Q&A box and then we'll select which question we want to address during the Q&A and discussion. Go ahead, Timer. I'll remind you again with my head popping like this when there's one minute left. Thank you. Thank you, Gita. Uh, since the participant, I see many from Indonesia, so please allow me to speak in Bahasa then, and also translates, translation also works. This is the so slide. this is how we read the traceability data in Indonesia. If I, if you read the title in Indonesia, we, uh, the data driven assessment of current status risk and future opportunities. So how we can anticipate the trend? Next slide, please.
as Robert has mentioned before, that on the left hand side it shows that actually the num amount of products of palm oil in Indonesia is increasing, ever increasing, and uh, at the same time the deforestation uh, decrease or decline. It shows actually that the our palm oil economy could go could also uh, go hand in hand with the declining deforestation. But this shows that uh, Indonesian palm oil industry could be developed without deforestation. So it is not uh, it is not an impossible thing for uh, palm oil to be developed uh, while also uh, not conducting deforestation. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. Yeah, okay. Thank you. And where is the problem right now for our current position? If you could see on the right-hand side graph, we could need to review further where the deforestation happened, whether it is due to our performance or whether the there are no more deforested forests in the western side of Indonesia. I am personally uh, inclined on the second opinion. If you could overlay the with the palm oil laden province and also wood uh, timber rich uh, provinces. That means you could see that on the Papua, Kalimantan, Maluku and on the right hand side, 70% are still in terms of natural or old timber forests. And so, so we really need to protect those uh, natural forests, especially on the eastern part of Indonesia, especially on the Maluku, Papua, Sulawesi Tengah and Kalimantan. So it's, it indicates that there are a lot of natural forests that might be deforested or to become a palm oil plantation. And it was different in the western side in Sumatra because right now we only had uh, only in the natural forest consists in the uh, preserve uh, on the natural reserve and also on the well managed concession. It is different on the landscape on the eastern part of Indonesia. Next slide please. Next slide, please. Yeah. So, where we could see uh, on we uh, on how we sometimes we could probably misread this, we could see that there are many plantations, uh, oil pl palm oil plantation in uh, uh, forest laden uh, provinces. So there are twenty or thirty percent of the palm oil uh, plants are still in the uh, younger generation. So one day, hopefully, the production will be increasing. So the production on the first slide will most probably double in terms of production when the young palm oil plants uh, or trees will become uh, develop or mature age. So this is something that uh, so this is something that you, you, we must take caution uh, to read this data. Otherwise, we are going to misread. Uh, well, also you can go to the next slide. We are we really need to be cautious on the ideas of developing new palm oil mills. If we could see the current palm oil mills, eighty to ninety percent of them are cons uh, located in the western side of Indonesia. Eighty percent located are located in. Sumatra and Kalimantan. Meanwhile, deforestation trends to go to the eastern side. Well, there are a lot of young palm oil trees and plantations on the eastern side of Indonesia. Uh, so if we could see, you could read this day because there are a lot of afford capacity mill. Rather than closing the mills, we, we allow addis, addition, adding the palm oil mills on the eastern side. That would be dangerous. In there are several provinces where there are overcapacity, such as in Papua and others, if we mislead this data, we are going to allow or permit them to build additional mills. And it will be very dangerous because it will drive deforestation. So the key here would be how the, we could look at the next capacity. You could go to the next slide, please. Yeah. So if we model this to the several areas in Sumatra, especially in Aceh and Riau, on the left-hand side, we are going to uh, take the data of the deforestation uh, connected with the plantation oil. So 84% of deforest deforestation due to palm oil 
are consisting in the 20 kilometer radius from the uh, mills. The closer it was to the mills, the more it will be deforested. So this is the danger of allowing mills to be established. Can you click on the video, please? Thank you. Yes, this is the example of we are trying to develop or build in Riau, how the mills are established in 2007 and deforestation came and happened. So the mills are the driver of def uh, deforestation. So it is not the pl establishing the plantation first. So it is the mills, pl establish on the mills. How in the Riau, after mills came, deforestation occurred uh, uh, so uh, skyrocketed after the mills were established. So this is something that should become our notes. Next slide, please. And what we need to do then, I think right now Indonesia is being set back uh, through several policies and political factors. Right now we had 2.4 million hectares of natural forest within palm oil concession. So they legally could convert this natural forest into palm oil plantation especially the job creation laws open up for this opportunity. So if Mr. Joko asks whether it is protected or what, I think there is no legal protection towards natural coverings. But what we could do would be to uh, encourage the, or the uh, urge the companies to protect the natural forest, uh, such as HCP, HPS. This is not a legal protection, it's only a voluntary agreement. And more than half of those natural forests are in the Kalimantan and Papua. So all of these are our natural forests within the palm oil concession. So these are the ones we need to protect. How we could do that? By providing incentives. Maybe you don't need to revoke the license because sometimes the local government will release the issue new permits anyway. So how this company would gain profit this, despite not converting it into palm oil uh, plantation. So by protecting the nature force, they could get the incentive in terms of price and others. But not only to the company, but also to the district government and the provincial government or the local government or even to the village government and also to the community on how we could see in the com in Papua, for example, when there, uh, are, there is a company who uh, deforested a natural forest, the community speaks up and resisted that. So if we are talking about fiscal transfer, we should go to this kind of zone or uh, uh, area which needs to be protected and and nationally, we need to have a fiscal transfer to this uh, local government and, and to build regulation which ensure the remaining natural forest protection. And also the third part would be uh, uh, some uh, acts towards the companies to encourage them to, dis uh, to leave or disband uh, deforestation. I think that's all for me. Now we go back to the discussion. Wow, okay. So we had, actually, we had uh, about one minute left for time for you, Mr. Timur. Well, thank you for donating the one minute for Q&A. Um, thank you so much, Timur, for um, donating one minute for the discussion session. Um, and we will be actually um, having our panelists, um, not only Timer and Robert will be joining us, uh, we also have Helen uh, that's going to be joining us for Q&A. Uh, &A. And um, super excited to see all of the questions coming in. Um, we cannot answer everything, but hopefully we'll do you justice by selecting some of the ones that are representing a lot of the curiosity. And the panelists have also, if you have put your Q&A, uh, your question in the Q&A box, please check the answered box because some of them have been answered um, in writing. So the question from James Hewitt and Cecile have been uh, answered in writing by Toby Gardner, by Jolene, uh, and also by Helen. Thank you so much. Um, now we move to the first question um, and 
this is i think open uh for uh robert to um address but uh Timer, if you have any comments feel, please feel free to join in as well and helen uh the question is from sanjeev lewis um hi sanjeev uh, thank you for joining um curious how the researcher and also the national and subnational government agency feel about the frequent removal of land including hcv and hcs area from companies license um or even have in some cases and this exposes um forested areas or areas with biodiversity value to deforestation and conversion to other land uses um how can this practice uh, be stopped and ensure uh, companies continue to have responsibility to protect their hev hes area especially for forests inside their concession so if you want to start us off uh, robert with the data in terms of uh, forest area inside concession and then i'll go to timer for his opinion in terms of how this actually translate into maybe new policy levers, uh, both at the national and subnational le uh, level. Take it away, Robert. Perfect. Thanks, Gita, and thanks, Sanji, for the excellent question. I mean, for me, on the data side, this is one of those questions that I'm really interested in. But the challenge really is that that data is not available. Right? That this is a, a constant source of, of of challenge of getting consistent concession boundaries for the Indonesian palm oil sector, just at any point in time is a challenge. And seeing those changes through time is really, really difficult. So understanding how pervasive this problem is, is something that I've been very interested in, but have been unable to really tackle. And I think it speaks to the need to have more public transparency in what those concession boundaries are, how they're being changed, what the revisions are. We've worked quite a bit with Timur on, on kind of trying to pull together that documentation and data and with David Gabo, who I think is also here for the pulp sector, it's been even harder for the palm sector. Um, I do think that's an important thing. You know, if you are doing an HCV HCS uh, assessment, you are committed to conserving and protecting those lands. But at the same time, your concession says you are going to develop it for oil palm. And I think there's a fundamental tension there of how we think about um, what that would look like going forward. And I'm curious what Timur has to say on how to redesign policy to make that more effective. Um, go ahead, Bang Timer, maybe additional comment on the policy side of things. We also have Jason joining us um, in the Q&A panel. Thank you for joining us as well, Jason. Um, go ahead, Timer. Yeah, one thing for sure on this actually transparency of those companies that we know that uh, uh, declare it's a zero deforestation commitment as far as I know, not, not publish actually every single hectares of their CDC, GDC area. So that, that's one thing that we need to push to make sure, for example, we, we publish some companies uh, that uh, uh, depore uh, deforesting some areas but they said it is not least in their in their HCP area. So then there is dispute on this, and it is from the, the, the let's say the from the company company side, but also from Indonesia and from the government side, we need also to provide a legal legal a standard legal mechanism to protect all natural forest cover wherever they are in Indonesia. So I think those two is uh, because sometimes in Indonesia case in the the government consider this forest within palm oil concession as abandoned area. We yeah. call it Tanah yeah. Pelantar. And then that's yeah. the- that, that's asset. The, yeah, that's the, the window for them to then to, to grant new companies uh, of new permit to those areas. So I think we need to campaign, we need to push both, uh, both of our government and, and companies on this. Yeah, Gita. Thank you, um, Bang Timer. Uh, very supportive of that idea as well. In some of our district, for example, the local government is actually inventing new ways of guarding that remaining forest inside concession through local regulation. But sometimes the local regulation is debated by the national one. So we need to have a stronger narrative as well. Now, going to that particular point, I'm going to combine um, three questions, actually, and uh, we'll talk about incentives a bit, yeah. Um, there's one anonymous attendee that didn't put the name. Um, there's Jamal 
Udin and also there's Saskia Ozinga that all talks about incentives. Um, and maybe I'll start with Helen and then let the Jason and Robert to come in um, on this question. So what actually the type of incentives that can be provided by the market, um, outsiders um, like EU, but also buyers from China and India, uh, which the data showcase that this is a, also a re relevant market uh, for Indonesia if they want to clean up their supply chain. How can we first identify what type of incentives that's out there and secondly also influence buyers from countries in, uh, like China and in, in India that has not been as uh, vocal as EU for example in terms of prioritizing deforestation free commodities and um, hopefully this um, in, in your answer you can also recommend some option uh, that allows that incentives to trickle down directly to smallholders. So if there's any recommendation or any thoughts uh, coming from Trace, maybe Helen, you can kick us out, kick us off, not out, but off. <laughs> Sorry. Um, yeah, I'm very keen to hear from, from Timo on this as well. I mean, I think this is a critical question that's been raised by many on the EU. We've heard from Robert, the data does show that the clear market signal from the EU and some of these demand side legislations and we've seen with ZDCs that there has been a reduction in deforestation intensity associated with that which is super positive but there's a big question alongside you know what are the incentives that the EU will will move forward on alongside its its um, proposed deforestation free products regulation and um, I think two really important components are one is a partnership with the Indonesian government so working with the Indonesian government both at the national level but also at the local level um, to support existing initiatives um, that are working. So whether that's supporting the uptake and strengthening of ISPO at the national level, but also working with the, the district governments that are trying to, to, to provide those incentives and to strengthen policy at the local level. Um, funding is gonna be a critical part of it as well. So really ensuring smallholder inclusion. I think a lot of, a lot of civil society in particular have highlighted the risks you know, of exclusion of smallholders from the EU market. And I think some of our data has started, you know, we haven't been able to really dig into the smallholder question, but we do see a segregation in the market of lower risk flows starting to go to the EU, higher risk going to China and Indonesia. So I think that's a real risk. Um, and, but, you know, we've seen historically that the market hasn't been really fully, you know, able to pay a premium for more sustainable palm oil. So I think there is this tension between demand side markets pushing constraints and costs um, to producers um, and that question of, you know, what does incentives really look like? So I'll hand over to Tima. Yeah. So Timur, you want to add on to how does it look like on the ground before I put um, Jason on the spot for any additional comments? Yeah, actually, we, we have a kind of, uh, let's say, good example with SPLK, uh, Timber Legality Assurance System uh, in timber, in, in timber sector. That is, it is market market uh, incentive, actually. Uh, then uh, if we we improve the current ISPO, I think it need to be improved a lot. We improve is ISPO to be uh, as, uh, let's say, as, as, let's say, transparent of, of SPLK. I think there is a, there is a, a good chance. That's a, that's a, that's to say that market incentive actually available. The the point is sometimes it is in our homework. I I, I push more on Indonesians. It is a, in Indonesia system at the moment. All this is decision. All the even the fiscal transfer. It's in national government. So I think we need to transfer a lot of this to local governments. You know, for palm oil at the moment in Indonesia. Most of the revenue, almost all the revenue, is actually go to national. Although they are in 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 local area, need to we call dana bagi hasil sawit. I think dana bagi hasil sawit is a uh, is a kind of a profit sharing of of revenue from sawit for palm oil. It's a, a a game changer. The other one is having like what Brazil before Bolsonaro. They have a kind of uh, uh, let's say a threshold, and then one day that uh, this uh, standard being uh, passed and then th there is this incentive for once that yeah. below the below that there is incentive the current indonesian uh, uh, financial system is actually hmm. subsidized or, or or embracing province or local government that e exploit more 
we need to we need to we need to uh we need to change it we need to make yeah we need to act we, we do not need to to subsidy the evil we need to we need to subsidy the, the angel actually so i think that's kind of uh even the nadesa for example uh not not quite clear actually what is the the let's say the data dasar how to say the milestone the baseline what is the, the, yeah. the baseline so uh, once we have the baseline every single desa every single kabupaten every single province mm. and then we know then the area where and then we we give incentive to the areas to the local governments and the local community so not only yeah. local government but local community that protect this below the the baseline i think that's that's the way that we need right. to we need to pursue thank you um and this resonates a lot with the current policy that's tried that the ministry of finance at least tried to communicate right the uh, fiscal for ecolog ecological fiscal transfer from national to province province to district hopefully we can get some indicators in thank you bang timer for that um any additional comment jason from your side uh, no, I think uh, Timur and Helen have covered it pretty uh, comprehensively. And yeah, again, stressing market incentive is an yeah, important role. Yeah. Can I um, can I then link to the next question for you? Basically, uh, in terms of filling that gap, uh, Timur mentioned about the limitation of baseline data at the ground level. And this relates to one of the questions from Agusari in terms of last mile traceability system. Um, and Robert earlier also mentioned there's data limitation when it comes to the analysis that Trace and its partners are uh, able to produce. Anything in particular, if um, you can ask the audience, there's a lot of audience here, if you can ask the audience to focus on one thing to actually fill that gap of uh, available baseline specifically at the local level um, when it comes to villages, smallholders, and the actual target recipient of these incentives, what would, what would it be? Um, yeah, I think, I mean, there's uh, definitely some improvements in more tra in traceability, especially traceability to smallhold to plantation. And I think uh, uh, it's just, you know, it's at an early stage and there's a lot of improvement that needs to come in that. Uh, and it'd be great to see more improvements in, in that, uh, in the role of, you know, improving and getting more information related to that, to especially traceable to plantation. So, yeah. Thank you, Robert. You want to chime in um, also on what is it that you would like everybody to focus on to fill in the data availability gaps? Yeah, I mean, it's kind of this is spanning a bunch of different things from how do we get smallholders incentives to how do we understand the supply chain? I mean, the, the gaps I think that we've identified that are really challenging for us are even, I mean, just simple production numbers of like, what is each refinery producing? That data isn't available. That would allow for us to have a much deeper understanding of the sector. Um, I think, as Pak Timur mentioned, I mean, we have a team of undergraduates that are manually digitizing the boundaries of HCS, HCV areas within concessions. And that is something where if you're committing to protecting that, you should make that very accessible in a GIS database of what are the areas that you're committing to protect. I think there are a lot of these data sources that are viewed as secrets, as trade secrets that exist out there. The, the volumes that you're sourcing from the mills, you're making the list of mills available, but not actually how much you're buying from each mill. The companies know this information. I think it really is an opportunity for leadership, whether it requires, like this is a, a step for ISPO that, you know, requiring this of every single producer, or if it's something that the leaders in the market can take on themselves. I think those yeah. are big opportunities for improving transparency in the sector. Thanks. And this basically resonates more about how do we understand everybody's role in terms of filling this gap and then divide, sort of like divide and conquer because not, not one single entity can actually fulfill all of the data needed um, by themselves, right? Um, thank you. Um, if everybody's following what's happening on the chat box, it's super active. It's like exploding. So all of the panelists, if you wanna also look at the comments, um, some are thanking you also for the answers, um, go ahead. We have uh, time for one more um, question, but before uh, I'd like to also read out this um, Q one of, it's not a question, but it's actually an information at the Q in the Q and A box. 
Um, so China um, has established due diligence standard for rubber exported to the country. Um, and uh, this is a good sign. Um, and uh, it's related to the questions earlier in terms of what uh, you already answered the panelists in terms of discussing with both China and India how to delink commodity driven deforestation and particular palm oil. So thank you for that additional information as well. Um, and last but not least in terms of uh, the question. Um, I'd like to combine several questions as well. Um, this is coming from uh, both Jun Zuo Zhang um, that is focusing on uh, procurement policy by companies and combined with Swarup Najad Na Nada Fajhala in terms of innovative access to financing across the value chain. And um, basically, the procurement policy, uh, said uh, Jun Zhao, is dominated by multinational companies operating in China. What would you say and what would you like to say to them um, in terms of finding the most effective way to engage themselves with China to promote sustainable palm oil in China? So the MNC that's outside of China, but operating in China, if you can be their strategist, for a day, for example, what would you recommend them to do in terms of engaging better in China from your insight? So I'll direct this question as a, a closeout almost before your closing statement. Um, to So we'll, we'll start with Timer, followed by Helen, and then um, Jason and Robert. So go ahead, Timer. If you can be a strategist of a multinational companies in China, what would you recommend them to do on engaging better? First, I think uh, it's uh, we, we already mentioned about the uh, the incentive in market uh, premium price, etc. But also one thing that uh, the 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 overseas companies, uh, particularly in financial, can do in this is pushing more transparency for sourcing. And in Indonesia, as as okay. trace trace uh, that you have a uh, inside that showing actually the dominance of vertical and integration in palm oil industry is actually only less than 50 players basically yeah. dominating Indonesia. So I think one thing that 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 uh, I think uh, push the transparency better that's the first one and the second one go directly to to the local to 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 let's say to verify the information out there. Uh, for example okay. in Indonesia in palm oil from Indonesia for example is a uh, Government always mention uh, or men openly often mention that uh, we need uh, or pump uh, smallholders. Actually, in our data, is only less yeah. than thirty percent of palm oil smallholders in the country, and okay. those are not linked with the deforestation. Only eight percent of them that that come from deforestation from the forest into thousands. So, so mm -hmm. only less than eight that come from, from the, the ground. Forest. Yes. So, yeah. so, so that I'm going to the, stop the you there. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I'm going to stop you there. <laughs> so, one is pushing for transparency and go directly verify to the source. Robert, do you want to continue with one sentence? <laughs> uh, I think for me, it's I don't know if it's the responsibility of those companies to push their consumers to change. I think it's the response. The interesting thing is in China and India. 70% of the flows are already going through the companies. I think those other companies can push for government policy in Indonesia to okay. create a level playing field for everyone. I see. So better at the producing region, yeah. Thank you, um, Robert and Helen. So I think just super quickly, there is some really exciting um, young change makers in China who are really pushing for greater visibility on yeah. sustainable palm oil. I think there's some really exciting, more visible things, whether it's labeling, whether it's producing more products uh, clearly labeled sustainable palm oil to give consumers in China that choice, even if it's a small percentage. I think that visibility on the consumer end is really important and quite exciting. So I think it's a combination of companies making that effort to, to try and label sustainable palm and make it clear what they are doing and trying to give a little bit more consumer choice, even if it's in the sort of luxury market to start with, um, I think could lead to, to more visibility in China and more, more options for change. And that's what we've seen 
from some of the webinars we've done yeah. with LTKL and our Chinese partners, um, there's some opportunities mm. there. Thank you, Helen. Um, Jason, what about you? Yeah, I've got a lot more to add. I think, yeah, Tim, uh, Robert and Helen made all good points, labeling transparency, all stuff that I think is pretty critical. Thank you. Um, so at, with that, uh, we'd like to give a big round of applause for all of the panelists. Thank you so much for all of you for uh, um, also joining the webinar today and also for providing us with insights at the, in the chat box. I'm pretty sure it's going to be safe now uh, as part of the feedback loop for uh, Trace's research as well. And the recording will also be available for you um, early next week, both in Bahasa Indonesia as well as in English. Uh, feel free to actually uh, drop your contact if you want Trace uh, to contact you after this webinar for specific questions, especially for the media partners as well. Um, there's a contact that you can also reach out to if there's any other question. The data that we've discussed today is available online at trace.earth. And you can also read the explainer around this work at insight.trace.earth. Um, and if you, again, have any further questions, feel free to contact the Trace team at any time on info at trace.earth. Last, uh, we would be very grateful if you can complete a very short survey at the end of the webinar and it should magically appear in your web browser once you end the webinar. Um, I'm going to close out with one uh, particular word that everybody are echoing right now, which is ACT. That's the word for today. And the A stands for accountability should be shared between government as well as producing companies. But it doesn't mean anything without credible data point. The C stands for consumer choices should be available both in retail as well as business to business transactions, especially in strategic market. And the T stands for transparency and traceability would be the key to actually make use of the available analysis right now with a more holistic perspective to free Indonesia from deforestation, especially in its palm oil supply chain. So act now, act together. Thank you so much. My name is Gita Shahrani. Sorry again for any mistakes and see you again in, in the next opportunity with Trace. Bye everyone.